I'm in continuation of my conversation, I now have Harsh Mandar uh, sitting with me today. Harsh, as you know, is a leading author, an activist, uh, a former bureaucrat, and to many of us think, a conscience keeper. Thank you, Harsh, for, for spending the morning with us today. In yesterday's presentation and in your book, Looking Away, you showed the mirror to us. You talked about how all of us look away, as you yeah. said. And it, it was actually a reality check for us. And I think we, many of us in the room saw that, that reality. Uh, so the question for you is, is it as bad as you, as you see it? Or are there green shoots of hope? Are there, are there things that are changing? You know, are, are there things that we can cling to saying, it doesn't have to be like this and we can, we can change? It is bad. I mean, I think that there's a, an enormous decline even uh, from the time I was a child. It, uh, you know, post in, I'm the first post-independence generation in a sense, so are you. Uh, but I remember a childhood where uh, there was great inequality, uh, but there was a certain restraint uh, among people of, of privilege to not throw about their wealth, not it was considered vulgar to, you know, to show off expensive uh, brand names. In fact, it was more elegant to wear a coat with a slightly patched kind of thing. There was a certain, your mother told you, don't waste food, there are hungry children outside. I think we, 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 we're passing through a, a particularly fatal uh, uh, normative kind of uh, situation in the middle class in India today. As I was saying, it's not inequality alone, but a normative framework which justifies this inequality. That is the worry to me. Uh, we can deal with the material consequences of uh, of inequality, but what? How do we deal with the moral consequences of what we are becoming as a as 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 a people? And I think there's always been the idea of caste, which is ultimately that it is fine and legitimate for your birth, the accident of your birth to determine the rest of your life. We've also absorbed the British idea of class, which is that wealth brings, uh, you know, uh, uh, fine thinking and art and culture and the poor are uncultured, etc. So the British idea of class and the Indian, uh, the Indian idea of caste were anyway a, a pretty dangerous combination. But I think now we have that the third, which is the neoliberal idea that greed is good. Why should I be ashamed? I've made my money, I'll you know, throw it about. And, and I think the combination of the three is what we are actually, we're not apologetic about uh, uh, you know, leaving uh, millions of people behind, living in situations of, of hunger and deprivation and illiteracy and uh, lack of health care, which are completely, avoidable in today's world. So I think that is the problem. But the hope that you that you talked about, of course, is there. And I'll give you so one odd example. You know, like in the December 16th moment in Delhi, uh, when uh, there was the gang rape, uh, the upsurge that happened, and I remember sitting at Chantarwantar where the protests were happening the day she died. And I was looking at the faces of young people, and I felt that here, is a young woman whose name we don't know, whose face we don't know, whose pain people felt as if it was their own. And that is public empathy. And so, so that the fact that we are still capable of that is important. But I also, at the same time, recognize the limits of that, of that public empathy. I mean, she was a woman, we, a young woman whom we thought was one of us. So we felt her pain. But in the same streets of Delhi where I work, uh, homeless women, uh, you know, I, in the first shelter we created for homeless women, I asked them what's changing their lives and they said, after 17 years I can sleep on the street and, you know, close my eyes at night and not be sure that nobody will rape me through the morning when I'm in a shelter. So that kind of, you know, but there are no candlelight marches to just say let's have shelters for homeless women or for women who are raped in communal riot situations or women in Manipur or Dalit women who are, who are uh, you know, treat. So I think that, that the fact that we have a capacity for public empathy, but we've limited the circle to people 
whom we think are like us. I think the recognition that actually the woman, uh, you know, the homeless woman who's sleeping on the streets is actually just like your mother or mine, except she's had a tougher life. I think that that recognition is still to be made. You talked about yesterday uh, several ways that companies can contribute to society, and you. Uh, also talked about that it's not the two percent but the ninety eight percent that matters, and this is perhaps could be one of the ninety eight percent. And I was just wondering whether there are any ways you think that companies like ours can create situations or enable our employees to be empathetic enough to not look away. What what do you think we could do? You know, I uh, uh, this uh, recognizing. The workers that we work with, for instance, as as people, you know, I, I remember when uh, I, I teach a course at IIM Ahmedabad, and instead of an exam at the end of the course, I ask my students uh, to go out and meet one poor person and write her or his biography, and I found that I mean year after year, uh, it's it's a journey that they find so difficult, but the fact that they they actually just outside the IIM Ahmedabad, uh, there's a whole set of homeless people who sleep. You've passed them hundreds of times. That's where you hang out. You've seen them, but you've never noticed them as people. To be able to sit just in front of one person and actually understand their life and to recognize the enormity of, of their dreams, their struggles, what they've been through. But I also feel that the kind of, you know, you talked about a million uh, hours of, of volunteering, uh, which I thought was fantastic. But I still feel that in India, I have very rarely seen engaged, committed volunteering of the kind that I've seen in other parts of the world. I think that people still think of it as, as a very transient, uh, you know, do-gooding kind of, feel-good kind of uh, thing. But I, you know, I've seen, um, even in a place like the US, I mean, you might have the CEO of a company who says, Thursday evenings, I'm going to serve food and uh, clean the floors in a, in a soup kitchen. And for him, it's an important commitment, and he will not compromise on it, and he'll go there. I think that kind of sustained engagement, uh, not uh, for the sake of, of, of optics and so on, we've still not cultivated. And I, I would really say that if, if since uh, the Tata Group is serious about it, I think if you could set, a, set a, an example of of people who then say they, you know, I'm good at accounts, so I'll go to this small NGO and try to help out, or I'd like to teach. But I'd like then I'll do it in depth, quietly. Uh, uh, that that I think would be one good thing in terms of creating empathy. The other part of the ninety percent you mentioned was uh, on displacement. Companies set up a new plant. They need land, they acquire land, they displace a lot of people. And your argument was that that even though you do that, you can do that in a responsible way. Can you tell us a bit more about what, what your thinking is? How can companies displace in a responsible way? In fact, let me give, it, give you this with a very tangible example. I was actually serving uh, in the Singroli area where large-scale displacement was happening with public sector units. And I was seeing that the degree of irresponsibility uh, is, is huge. The first is to minimize displacement and to really ask with every single individual that you're displacing or land you're taking, is there an alternative? Do I really need this? I think simply to minimize displacement is, and to do it, you know, that, that no compensation can, can you know, I, I'll ask you, you know, the home that you're living in, and in cities we don't have that kind of attachment. I'll give you some money and, and you just move out for the country's greater good uh, into some uh, place. And it's not, it's not easy and it's, 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 it's an uprootment and with tribal people who've lived for generations and so on. So I think minimizing displacement is one. But the other is to, uh, you know, uh, we do not make, the people displaced as partners of the development project. For them, it's it might be a development project for us or for the country, but for them, it's a, it, it's it's a it's like a decimation pro project, and it doesn't have to be. And with Singroli, I actually went in later first as as a district collector, and then later I I had asked them. I actually sat down with them and said, 
every single person, you know, you uh, a new township has come up. You have milk requirements. You have, uh, you know, vegetable requirements. You have a whole uh, degree of services that are required. Also, you need em employees not just at the unskilled level. Uh, you know, uh, the people locally may not have our skills, but in the generation period or from the time you conceptualize the project to the time it begins, you have almost a, you know, like a generation or half a generation. Why can't you actually build those capacities locally? If you are really committed to making sure that it is a development project for every displaced person, we still cannot compensate for the suffering of uprootment, but everything else we'll do. I have not seen a company which, which has tried to do that. And it is, it is really not rocket science. Uh, another aspect of the 98% was, uh, was outsourcing. This mm. is again something yeah. that many companies do. It, it, it informalizes mm. the sector and you're mm. absolutely right. And I think in many cases, companies would say that it's an economic necessity. It's, or somebody would argue that it's also because of the way uh, the laws yeah. are and so on. Again, the question uh, is, uh, and clearly many of our companies do it. I mean, there's, we, we can't deny that. Mm -hmm. So what are the kinds of things that our company should be doing to make sure that even when they do this, they do it in a manner that's humane, that's, that's the right way to do it, that's a responsible way to do it. What, what are the kinds of things that we should be looking at? I still feel that, you know, this whole way, you know, the idea that, that we are constrained by labor legislation, I contest that. I mean, if you really look at, there the are only about less than 10% of people in the formal sector who are in any way, you know, affected by labor legislation, of which about 6 to 7% is government. So 3 to 4% of formal employment is covered. And what we are seeing uh, is something that I've also understood uh, uh, more recently, is that even within the formal sector, we've already started, you know, uh, formal sector doesn't in, in even ensure formal employment. So we're going more and more into contract work. And that is a subversion of the law because you're not supposed to have contract work for perennial tasks. But we're still doing that. Uh, so already we, we have in, in, in informalized employment in the formal sector. And I think that that the uh, that the argument that uh, that the economic sort of balance sheet requires us to do that, I don't buy it. I mean, I really feel that we have to have a different kind of, of balance sheet. But uh, but the moment you get into outsourcing, uh, I'll give you an example. It's not connected with the Tatas, but with another company which I won't name. But uh, when the Commonwealth Games were happening in in Delhi huge amounts of construction were happening. I was invited uh, uh, to do a kind of a fact finding. And even for me, you know, you, you, because we live in Delhi, you see the, you know, the great stadium that was coming in, hidden from view, who were the workers working there? And just behind that, I, I went in with this fact finding and I found people working in, you know, the most unbelievably, you know, that was cesspools, there was uh, they just, they put sort of tin kinds of things uh, which were unbearable in the heat, unbearable in the cold, the children had no kind of uh, services at all. Uh, it, it was something that, that looked like you know 50 years earlier or something and here it was happening, it was a prime company which had got, uh, got the contract and then I was, the, what I realized was that, so, so you, you, it's a big multinational company gets uh, the tender, and then it subcontracts, and then it subcontracts, and then it subcontracts, and then it subcontracts, and it finally comes to people who, have, you know, these labor, uh, you know, sardars or something they call them, who go into India's poorest uh, rural areas where people are desperate for work of any kind. They bring them in only, I found, for four months. They're grateful for any kind of work, so they work at, you know, at the lowest kind of. Now, I am sure that when you, when the company gave the tender, it had tendered in a way that even if you employed people and gave them their legal rights, you would still make a reasonable profit. But clearly you're wanting to make a much bigger profit on the basis of, this is like classical, you know, what Marx used to describe as exploitation of labor in the most raw kind, which I was seeing playing out in the national capital. And the fact that globalization is actually pushing us more and more in that direction, I have a feeling that that uh, 
e even more than environment. I mean, I just feel uh, adhering to labor standards, paying your taxes, and not harming the economy is what I expect from companies. One of the interesting follow-ups has been how government has got, you know, got into this bandwagon. <laughs> Uh, the Swachh Bharat Kosh is a right. case in point where they're coming to many companies saying, Just you know, you got CSR money, put it in there. So many of our companies are asking, how do we deal with this dilemma? Yeah. Is it a dilemma? Is it just some of us who feel this is a hmm. problem? Uh, because this is an ask that is coming again and again. Yeah. I feel it is a completely illegitimate uh, uh, demand. And firstly, the 2%, we can debate about it. But a 2% where then government tells you what to do with it, mm. then just have a tax. Yeah. I mean, call it a tax, take it into the public funds and then be accountable for it. I mean, you cannot have, it's a voluntary mm. uh, thing, but we nudge and push you into, uh, into doing things that we want to do and we substitute budget expenditures mm. with, with, with CSR money. So even the kind of creativity that CSR would allow for you to sort of use your imagination and, and, and think of what you need to do is being compromised. So I think this is a, to my mind, absolutely, it doesn't make sense from any any side. And, uh, uh, and I'll repeat myself, but for me, CSR is really about, uh, about uh, paying your taxes, uh, uh, treating your workers lawfully and compassionately, and uh, uh, not destroying the environment. One last question, because I mean, I agree that this is this is what CSR should be, mm -hmm. but law is there. We <laughs> need to do it, and to me, uh, corporate social responsibility is nothing but basic development, but done by a company. Right. And I think one of the questions uh, that companies are facing is, how do we figure this out? How do we know that we are using the money? How, that, do, how do we use that? How our... do we even start? How do we make sure that we are, you know, looking at some of the issues you talked to us right. about yesterday? Right. I would feel that uh, I like what uh, Azim Premji does, which is his entire investment is to strengthen public systems of education. And I think that that's that's really something that and and, and in, even in the conversations that we had after my discussion, people talked about strengthening the primary healthcare uh, system. That's I think really strong, which is uh, it's not substituting what the state needs to do. It's it's making the state recognize that you're not doing what, what what needs to be done, and your systems, not setting up a private school, not setting up a a private clinic, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, so I think that, that that is there. And secondly, I would uh, urge that that in locations where you work, especially townships, etc., I've again served in places like Singrodi, and I, you know, the extent to which there's an exclusion uh, from the services that you provide to the displaced populations itself and to the working populations. That is, of course, I think, obviously where one needs to start. I mean, that that uh, that the same school needs to be open to people of the local community as is open to people who are employed in the company or the same public health services. And the last, because only because it's close to my heart, is uh, actually Bill Gates and Azim Premji had invited me once to speak to a whole set of rich people about you know why they should give away their wealth, and and at some point when I was speaking, I was saying, I was, if I fantasize, if I had the kind of money that you have, what would I do with it? And I had said one thing: I would even if one of them decided, no child should be sleeping on the streets. I mean, that's something that is feasible. I mean, I worked out the the costs. So if you're located in a city, the population that you need to serve is a little less clear. But I think that 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 this collective, uh, you know, model failure of seeing these children every day and looking at uh, children, uh, as I said, one kilometer away from where my own child sleeps, uh, you know, being raped through the night, sleeping alone on the streets through summer, winter, rain, uh, picking rags. At least that is something that I, in cities I feel that if we collectively decide, uh, uh, ensuring that no child uh, leads a life which is um, completely acceptable is just one third thing that I would like to talk about. Hmm? Great. Well, thank you again. Thank what you. a pleasure chatting. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.